Today, I'm talking with Luca McKay, but you may know her on Instagram as Boob to Food. She is the author of Milk to Meals, a guide to inspire, inform, nourish, and nurture you and your baby's journey to food. Luca is a registered nurse, a registered midwife, and a certified nutrition consultant specializing in postpartum and babies. Luca, g'day. Hello. <laughs> so now, where, where are you? Are you in, I know it's nice to hear, isn't it? Are you in New, Newcastle? Yeah, I am, yeah. Yeah, rainy Beautiful. Newcastle today. Mighty Newy. Yeah. Wow. Um, let's yeah. start <laughs> at one of my favorite subjects that there are to start with. Uh, let's talk about breast milk. Why is it so good? Oh, gosh. It's amazing for so many reasons. The I guess the biggest difference between breast milk and any other milk is that it's alive, So, which means that it's got you know living pathogens microorganisms beneficial bacteria and so um you know it's also a complete uh food so complete food source it doesn't need any supplementing it doesn't need anything extra it doesn't need you to pair it with anything else it's a complete source of everything that your baby needs and um yeah it's alive so it can help target you know infections and sickness and there's so many other things too like it's amazing in that it produces itself that it can self-regulate itself that it can change um you know increase its white cells when your baby is sick it's yeah i could go on forever but it's amazing yeah well, i mean <laughs> so I, I, many I, reasons. I, I'm, we're, we're here for it i mean i i uh, supplement with colostrum um and milk breast milk is obviously incredibly high in colostrum i know a number of bodybuilders actually try and get human breast milk so that they can you know their their because their growth hormone yeah. increases their growth hormone um can you talk a little bit about colostrum yeah so colostrum's the first milk um generally that, that comes out so a lot of people say when's my milk in but your milk is still the colostrum at the beginning um and the colostrum can start in the pregnancy at any time so you know a lot of people get it just after the first trimester they might start noticing a little bit of leaking and it's that beautiful yellow gold hue color um and then it'll stay just like that until you have your baby once your body has recognized that it's birthed the placenta and realized that it's had a baby uh and your baby starts suckling it'll sort of change into that more mature milk and that more creamy color that we are more familiar with uh, but Colostrum is incredibly high in, yeah, like amazingly high in antibodies, amazingly high in, um, like you said, like amazing building blocks for growth. Um, it's an incredible fat. It's, yeah, antibodies, T cells, it's insane. And so I always say to people, you know, if you even just, so many people will think, oh, I, I don't want to breastfeed or I don't even want to go down that path. And I say, if you can even just get, that little bit of colostrum into them um it starts them off for you know such a good start to life it sort of starts to line their gut that hasn't got any lining in it at the, when they're first born and yeah it's just beautiful and, and nourishing and you can express it in your pregnancy as well which is amazing and it keeps producing itself so uh your wife's pregnant she she could <laughs> you could get a bit of a supplement from her <laughs> oh, I've, been I've been i've been i've been asking her every day i'm like when, when's it when's it coming <laughs> um I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about that though because i want to find out about you know when a woman is breastfeeding how taxing is it on their body um well it is but i guess the body's got pretty good uh self-regulations to to be able to deal with it and so whilst it can be taxing in some ways you know generally speaking you just need to uh if you just eat a little bit more and listen to your body and drink a little bit more then you know generally speaking you're okay um my biggest tip is to which a lot of people don't know is to stay on their prenatal supplement the entire duration of breastfeeding and if they're not breastfeeding for at least that first six weeks and a lot of people don't know that they're not told that they should stay on that and basically that prenatal will just act as a bit of a buffer um for any sort of nutrients that you might not be getting enough of in your diet and it will just sort of help you to yeah not fall off the wagon i guess but it is important to get your bloods done postnatally um make sure that you don't have any specific deficiencies and uh, you know work from there if if there is something you need specifically supplementing with which breast milk can 
you know, potentially deplete you of a little bit. The biggest one is mm. calcium because if if you're you don't have enough calcium in your body, the the breast milk's pretty clever and so it will actually um, start to leach the calcium from your own bones to compensate to make sure that the baby's got enough. So the baby's always fine, but the mum can end up a little bit depleted. And that's some new research coming out now with the um, osteoporosis becoming a little bit more prevalent in younger women and they're seeing that it could potentially be from those breastfeeding long breastfeeding years if they're not eating enough calcium how what are the great what are the best ways to eat enough calcium uh well the biggest one's generally dairy whether you tolerate Mm -hmm. dairy or not so Mm dairy is an easy one to get it with because it's also got the cofactor vitamins that help the calcium to um, be absorbed best by the body um so vitamin uh, d and k but calcium's um found in so many other foods and so it doesn't have to be uh you know milk drinks like a lot of people think they have to drink milk to be able to get calcium but there's other forms of dairy that's you know just as high in calcium that's easier digested by the body so fermented dairies like kefir uh greek yogurt or dairies high in fat and that are lower in the milk protein so like butter um they're really great to have in your diet or if you don't tolerate that goat's milk can be a really good one as well or sheep milk or camel milk or whatever floats your boat there. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you don't tolerate dairy, which a lot of people don't, then other forms could be things like chia seeds are really high. Um, nut butters, they're usually better than whole nuts because you generally need quite a lot of them. So the butters can be good because you get a lot more bang for your buck. So mm-hmm. say almond butter is a really good one. Tahini as well is really high. And then the other ones that are great are uh, um, your fish with bones in them. So you want to actually eat the bones because they're the things that's the highest in calcium. So things like tin sardines, tin salmon, uh, tin mackerel, all the ones with the bones in them that are nice and soft if you can mm. manage to eat the bones, which if anyone yeah. hasn't done it, I know it gets a bit scary like it's a fish bone, but it's not. It's really soft. <laughs> yeah, especially when it's been in the can, it's kind of mushy and delicious. I remember I used to eat yeah. that after a while too. I love that stuff. So, so those are great tips, you know, eating more, particularly when you're breastfeeding to nourish your body. But what exactly do you think is good to eat? Like, you know, um, is there anything particularly that you think that women who are breastfeeding should be eating more of? Um, high, high fats would be really important. To be honest, I would probably recommend this for everyone. I think we all should eat more high fat, um, lots of protein um, Mm -hmm. and lots of nourishing carbohydrates. So I know it's very easy and I do it too. I'm not saying that I don't, you know, just to grab a piece of toast and eat on the run or, um, you know, a lot of these sort of refined, simple carbohydrates that are great, you know, to give you that short burst of energy that you need or that quick fix, but they're not going to nourish you. They don't contain a lot of you know nutrients per se unless you're going to load that toast up with lots of goodies um and so mm-hmm. more things like your you know whole root vegetables things that are going to sustain you for longer this is not a time to calorie count or worry about um yeah. how much you're eating when you're breastfeeding you actually burn up to 500 calories a day just breastfeeding alone mm-hmm. um and on top of what the body's already already burning and so right we do require a lot more food so especially in those early days most women will say and i know i was the same they're ravenously hungry and it's really important just to listen to your body ravenously hungry and ravenously thirsty so drinking lots of water and staying really hydrated is really important um and i guess the other things would be having a lot of um dha in your diet is important as well Mm -hmm. uh Personally, I generally recommend a supplement of DHA, whether it be cod liver oil or if plant-based to do like a marine algae, just because the needs are quite high for yourself and then you're also producing that for your baby. And uh, there's that, you know, beautiful saying about mum brain that you've probably heard, you know, yep. and maybe ex- if your um, partner's experienced it, but I know that I have it all the time. Um, and <laughs> the DHA, well, Basically, the studies have shown that, you know, we're actually getting rid of some of the cells that we, the brain, you know, memories and things that we don't need to learn new things like how to keep a child alive, things that are more yeah. important. But the other thing that they've linked it to is that not enough DHA and that the brain's actually depleted of DHA sometimes. So 
that's an important one. Um, the other thing I like to include is fermented foods uh, to get that beneficial bacteria for yourself. A lot of um, mums, a lot of mums would have had antibiotics in labour or postpartum or during a cesarean section um, mm-hmm. or even just, you know, to get their general gut health um, for everybody to have fermented foods every day is really great for them as well and to, I guess, nourish their own digestive system as well <laughs> coming out of pregnancy and into postpartum. Sure. They would be my main things and obviously calcium that we've already talked about. Um, if, if you don't think that you eat enough, you might want to look into getting a calcium supplement if um you know tin fish or dairy or you know you're not eating a lot of chia seeds or you know your dark leafy greens and things like that then a calcium supplement could be worthwhile um and the other one is iron because that is really important for a mum as well um that's really important to keep up because a lot of times you know women will lose it's normal to lose up to 500 mils of blood um after they've had a baby but a lot of women will lose more and a lot of women go into labor with low iron source to start with so that's one of those ones to get individually tested to see but eating a high iron diet would be beneficial anyway um for yeah breast milk production as well um if you have if you're anemic your breast milk production is going to be uh, inhibited to a degree it will still produce but um maybe not to the extent that it can if you're really anemic so it'd be great to keep that up yeah well, main thing. <laughs> I, I like i like those ones i particularly like the water one because um when when cara my wife had chaplain um my son um, my mother-in-law was around a lot and so like there wasn't a lot for me to do you know when you walk into a room and there's two women there who are trying to sort out a problem it is not necessary <laughs> for the man to be there at that time so i would just come in and they were dealing with some problem and i'd be like and i'd my whole thing first six weeks this is my tip to all husbands is waters anyone waters and i would all i would do (laughs) water runs that was me i was just the water guy (laughs) i was the water guy i I wanted to i wanted to to ask about um high iron like you know eating enough iron what are what are the best ways to do that would you say dark leafy greens red meat well it depends if you eat meat or not um right but you know the my biggest i mean obviously the biggest thing is that heme iron sources which are your animal products are the highest Mm. form of iron in terms of absorbability so um you know some vegetables can be or lentils and beans and things can be high in iron but the amount that the body actually absorbs is a lot less compared to heme sources of iron which is your meat sources and eggs so if you consume meat, then that would be the easiest way. Um, and again, meat contains all of those, uh, you know, co-founding um, nutrients that will help it all to be absorbed as well. So the the meat would be the best one. Liver is my favorite. If people follow me, they would know that I talk about that quite a lot because it is the highest form yeah. of iron. <laughs> and a lot of people are really grossed out by it. but um, I don't know why. I think it must just be some, gen- I don't know, somewhere in the generations it's become a gross thing. It used to be very popular and a sought after piece of meat and now it's like, oh, it's liver. Um, well, it's interesting, yeah, isn't it? Because so, it, went from, it went from a sought out after piece of meat and then it went to, what am I, chopped liver? Which kind of like, which yeah. was the saying <laughs> that made everyone think, oh, chopped liver's nothing. And then recently gross. it's yeah, come true. back into... Uh, it's it's fashion it's i mean it's not fashionable but it's like do you understand how yeah. good liver is for you do you understand that somebody was saying that lions like the first thing that they go for is for the organs for the liver and for the heart yeah well even um the, if you look at into western a price who went and sort of studied all of those sort of cultures that are long living and healthy and doing well um because they eat the whole animal the livers and other organs are actually usually set aside for people who need the nutrients the most. So the pregnant women, um, wow. the, the little babies, the elderly, the sick people. So it's quite interesting. And then everyone else gets the things that, you know, the I don't know, chicken breast or yeah. whatever, the things that we always buy that yeah. you know, is usually um, that's because they're not as nutritious. They're still great, obviously, and not 
disregarding them, but they're not as nutritious as the liver. But people who are really irked out by that, there's so many amazing things like dried liver now that you can use that's so easy to, um, you know, just add into foods. I often just add dried liver into our foods now. I used to do the whole chopping, grating, cooking it, et cetera, but it's actually quite yeah. hard to find good quality liver in a lot of places. And so right. for a lot of people, the desiccated liver, dried liver can be a really good option. Um, and again, like the prenatal that I take now postpartum, um, that has liver in it as well, which is good to know. Um, but any, any red meat uh, is great. Uh, or also your things like your chicken thigh, um, wild salmon, they're all really nice and high in iron. But if you don't eat meat, then, uh, there are other ways that you can get iron, of course, in your diet. The biggest ones are generally your things like your lentils and beans and dark leafy green vegetables. Mm -hmm. uh, the important thing, though, with plant-based sources of iron, like I said, is that they aren't as well absorbed by the body. So uh, your heme sources, which is your red meats and things, are absorbed about 25 to 40% of that iron will be absorbed by the body, whereas the non-heme, which is your plant-based sources, uh, about 0 to 13% will be absorbed by the body. So it's a lot less. And so you have to kind of work a little bit harder to get the body to be able to access all of the nutrients that, that are available in those plants. So um, I'm not sure if you've heard of like soaking and souring your grains and beans. Um, but Somebody asked, basically, one, of the, one of the followers asked that question because I think that she must know you. Yeah, okay. So, well, it's, so <laughs> I don't, I'm not familiar with souring. Could you yeah, explain that a little bit? Yeah, so... Souring, I guess, is one step further than soaking. So basically beans and legumes have a thing called phytic acid on them and phytic acid is essentially like a, basically if you imagine like a coating over them, um, the, but what that coating does is it's an anti-nutrient and actually stops you being able to absorb all of the nutrients that is available in that. Say, for example, we're talking about a bean, all of the, the nutrients available in the bean. And so basically if you soak them for a period of time, each food has a different, you know, you can Google how long you should soak each food for because they will have a specific mm -hmm. different amount. But it doesn't matter how, you know, if you do it longer, that's fine. But some of them, you know, some of them are available in two hours. I always just do it overnight because it's easier and I don't have time to Google every food. So overnight soak and it's done. Um, but if you soak them, basically what happens is that that phytic acid around the bean is broken down and then more of the nutrients are available when you actually eat it. So souring, however, is adding something sour to uh, the soaking. So you might add a bit of lemon juice or apple cider vinegar or a bit of whey um, and anything kind of in that sour category will work and basically that mm -hmm. will break it down even further and um, make it more di easier to digest because that that bean sort of softened and broken down even more and then when you cook it the cooking time is actually a lot less because it's a lot softer than it started with as a dried bean for example right. and so doing that would be very important for someone who was following like a plant-based diet because you want to try and maximize as much nutrients as you can from the the foods that you're getting you're eating um but the other thing that's really important when you're talking about non-heme sources of iron is that you need to pair it with vitamin C as well because, like I said, in meat, you don't have to really worry about this as much because there's lots of other cofactors that are helping to absorb the iron in the meat um, that are just mm -hmm. naturally there in the foods. But when you're talking about plant-based, you do need to add a source of vitamin C alongside so you know if you are having beans chuck some capsicum or tomato in there or have a little orange juice or something just to help the body to absorb that iron and trying to keep it away from calcium as well so it's still a bit of a tricky one but try not to have yeah, too much dairy for example with the iron <laughs> right it sounds just so much more complicated if you're going to go you know vegan or plant-based <laughs> while, while breastfeeding i mean i think as an adult when you're not breastfeeding when another human isn't relying on you for their energy source it might be a bit easier but this it sounds fairly complicated if you're going to try and be vegan while breastfeeding i i yeah like i, I would really try and stress not to go down that path but to start that path when you're in that zone or you know right. pregnant or breastfeeding 
a lot right. of people obviously go into pregnancy already being a vegan for a long time and so have their systems in place pretty well and mm-hmm. um for anyone that was to go plant-based though i'd hope that they would speak to a practitioner to have an individualized sort of um plan and to go through all of this stuff in more detail to talk about supplements because there's extra supplements that vegans uh, or plant-based need to take that they don't get from food especially when you're going into pregnancy just to make sure that that you and your baby are getting all of the nutrients that that they need so yeah um, it also seems, yeah, it seems I, like I would a try not to start time. that diet when you're both eating. that's what i was going to say like it just yeah. seems like it not not the greatest time to start a plant-based diet is when you're you got to, you know when you're pregnant or when you're breastfeeding yeah. it, like it's kind of similar to exercise i remember hearing like if you lift weights four times a week while you're not pregnant and then you get pregnant you can continue to do that but it's not the time to like start viciously working no, out you wouldn't start it yeah for it, sure and you know on the flip side most i hear many stories this is just very anecdotally that many people start craving meat and dairy products in their pregnancy um which you know is generally speaking their body crying out for some nutrients and Mm -hmm. then that sort of starts them down the opposite path so i don't i haven't really heard of many people who decide to go down that path during pregnancy or postpartum it's generally i hear the opposite um and i know like I, i don't have much dairy in my diet but i know um when i was pregnant i really craved dairy like like nothing else so i was obviously needing a little bit more calcium or something yeah it's interesting <laughs> any any foods that you should stay away from while breastfeeding uh drugs and alcohol <laughs> no. right that's that's the only one <laughs> you, there's nothing that you should <laughs> oh and i mean you can have alcohol just you know trying to get plastered um <laughs> but you yeah the the food say no there's no foods that you need to stay away from when you're breastfeeding the only ones would be if you notice your baby is reacting to something then you might want to go down the path of eliminating and seeing if it was that food um mm. but the old wives tales of you know don't eat garlic and onion and chocolate and whatever else that they're saying um yeah. that's not true some babies yes will react to those foods and some babe some people will have to go off of those foods but it's not overly that common or the other one to be mindful of is your caffeine of um consumption sorry i should say you can definitely have caffeine just the same as pregnancy not to overdo it you know i don't know how to yeah. um i don't know how to what's the word equivalent to in america what how much caffeine you know what because your coffee cups are huge well, <laughs> like if I yeah, yeah but it'd be large it'd coffee, be... that might be like a bucket to you <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true we, we americans just do everything bigger but like i mean i, I cappuccino yeah. is the same size everywhere i feel like just a like a cup of coffee a day is fair yeah like it, well you know i would tell people here a double shot is fine a day so which is right. like our equivalent of like a, a large flat white or cappuccino or a long black or something yeah. but yeah, I'm a bit, um, I think it's technically it's like 330 milligrams a day of caffeine you can have if you want to go down that path. But I don't know if you can Got ask it. your barista for that much. <laughs> I, um, when, when, when Cara first had Chaplin, we went out for a few drinks uh, a couple of weeks and when he was a couple of weeks old and um, she had to pump and dump because she'd been drinking. So um, that was a very intimate moment for us where I, I, <laughs> I sucked it out because I was like, this is beautiful colostrum with a little bit of alcohol in it. I'm going to take care of this, please. And so, yeah, highly recommended little intimate moment there for all the, um, for all the hubbies. <laughs> um, I remember let's um, talk. needing oh, mine to do that and he wouldn't do it. <laughs> well, I'd also had a few drinks, so I was feeling fairly loose. And by the way, on that car trip on that, like in that car, like I forget I'm not saying I was, I, I think I'd had maybe one drink, two drinks. And so I was driving and Cara <laughs> was squirting me with her breast milk, <laughs> like in my face. I just, I was driving, I was like, oh, and I, I, I'd never seen anything like that. I loved it though. It was a very fun little moment. Um, oh, I, wanted, <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about formulas um, because, uh, well, clearly not everyone can breastfeed and not everyone um, 
uh, some can be difficult for some people. Some people can't do it at all. Let's talk about uh, which ones that mum should stay away from. Um, I don't think I would out any particular brands or anything like that. There's not really some you should stay away from. I would just try and um, look for the best options that you have. And so mm -hmm. <laughs> formula is hard. There is not many great ones on the market. Um, mm -hmm. And what is available here in Australia is probably very different to what is available where you live because it's all shocking. the ones that I know it's are Australian so brands. horrifying. The If you go... Yeah. If I just took you down to my local pharmacy and we had a look at the formula, because I went there one yeah. day because we'd run out of we'd run out of Holly, which is a European one, goat yeah. goat milk one. Holly is good. And yeah. and we and so we went to find some I went to find something, anything at the CVS in America, and I was just blown yeah. away by the ingredients, like the trash. Yeah. Everything, soybean yeah. oil, corn oil. I'm like, what I mean, I felt horrible because Somebody doesn't have the option. There is somebody's buying this. Yeah, for sure. And a lot of people yeah, don't know what to look for. And like I said, there's not a lot of them aren't that great. Um, there's a couple in Australia that I generally recommend. Hip and Holy are good, um, which you mm -hmm. can generally buy worldwide. But here in Australia, they're really hard to import. So some people find them really hard to access. Um but yeah, I mean, in an ideal world, you would look for no preservatives, but most contain them. Um, I would try and get organic if you could. I would try and avoid corn syrup as an ingredient if you can. Mm -hmm. um, I would try and avoid palm oil. Um, and yeah, go from there, I guess. It's, it's yeah, I don't really know any brands out there that, that I can recommend in america here there's one called little oak that's good um and there's one called mama moo but they're both australian and new zealand so if anyone from here is listening then right they can be um probably the best that i have found on the market did you recommend do you recommend supplementing like in the formula like putting in probiotics or anything like that yeah um i would recommend probiotics for formula fed babies until they're on solids and can eat fermented foods, then you can mm. just swap over to that. Because at the beginning we talked about how breast milk is alive and ever changing and is helping develop their you know, gut bacteria. The one thing that unfortunately formula doesn't have is, is that. So nutritionally wise, yes, it's going to meet all of the nutritional needs for your baby, but it's not going to, um, and this isn't to put any shame obviously because like we've said, people need to formula fee for all different reasons. and mm -hmm. um, But you can easily do that by adding a probiotic to it. And so um, I would definitely look into doing that. The other thing that I would look into, um, a lot of formulas do contain DHA, but uh, generally during like the whole processing, you know, system, DHA generally has to be in a fat-based fat, fat -based to be able to be absorbed properly. And so it's obviously mm -hmm. formula is turned into a powder. And so I would add a um, DHA supplement as well to the formula um, mm -hmm. just to make sure that you're getting that. So you they shouldn't really overdo it too much in terms of if your formula says it has DHA. I haven't seen one that has very much in it. So it should be okay. But double check with a practitioner if you want to make sure you're doing the right thing, of course. Yeah, we did that. We also, we put a probiotic in um, Holly when we were using formula and we also put a um, cod liver oil yeah. into the, so the into the Holly. Is that DHA? Is that, is that in yes, cod liver oil? Yes, that's the DHA, yeah. Sorry. That's, yeah. So nice. you've got, yeah, cod liver oil or um, like we said, with uh, plant-based, you've got marine algae. Mm -hmm. um, now, cod liver oil will completely change the taste of the bottle, um, like completely whatever you put it in, it's very strong flavor. And so uh, just, you know, if you start young, generally speaking, then they'll be okay. But if you're trying to introduce it later, they might start refusing their bottles. And obviously we don't want that. Yeah. So if that's happening, then just give it separate to the bottle. That's fine. Um, like on a little spoon, just give it to them with that so that they're not refusing the bottles because obviously that's more important. The other thing with the probiotics is not to heat them up in the formula. So probiotics can't be heated um usually past body temperature and so 
generally when you're actually offering the formula to baby it's below body temperature it's gone into that lukewarm you know but you wouldn't want so you could add them then at that stage but you don't want to add them and then heat the formula hot you know got it because that'll denature the good bacteria that you're trying to give them yeah got it i've been taking cod liver oil for years because my mum was a nurse so vitamin c and cod liver oil was what we had every day and i still have flashbacks to like accidentally biting <laughs> into the cod liver oil oh and yeah and it's just not a pleasant wasn't a pleasant moment <laughs> don't recommend see my my kids are seven and four and they have well my older two sorry and they have had it every day since they were six months old wow. and they love it they ask for it every morning i find them in the fridge like sniffing it it's so funny <laughs> 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 they've gone into it a few times and spilt it everywhere and if anyone has spilt cod liver oil it's a freaking nightmare it's oh, like gross. Stinks and it's so hard to get yeah we had one bottle explode we lived in a caravan for like nine months traveling when we had okay. a few years ago and we had a bottle of it explode in our fridge in the caravan when we were off grid with no power and it was not not fun <laughs> disgusting that sounds dreadful <laughs> especially when it would be it really hot too we got really hot and stinky it was, it was hot. terrible yeah and we had no power so it was just it was foul <laughs> it was so disgusting and it um, went through all our fruit and veggies like infiltrated everything and we were uh, we had shopped up big to be off grid for a week and so we had to everything we ate just tasted like cod liver it was horrible oh my gosh <laughs> it reminds me of my mum yeah. she used to cut up like she used to use one knife to cut up an entire meal and included in that would be, you know, she cut everything up with the one knife and then she'd cut up oranges at the yeah. end. And so you'd have oranges yeah. that tasted like onions. Yeah. <laughs> but she was saving water. God bless her. Um, let me ask you one more question about the formula. Cow versus goat formula. Any opinion on that? I tend to prefer goat just because goat's milk generally is easier digested but if someone's baby's already on cow milk for me and they're tolerating it fine then that's fine to continue on um, mm -hmm. but if I was to start one I would probably try the goats first um, it's just yeah less of that uh, milk protein a bit easier for the body to work with and digest and so a lot of people when they start formula will notice a few digestive issues to start with uh, mm. as the body gets used to it and like we said a lot of people don't tolerate cow's milk um because we've sort of had to evolve as a species to tolerate cow's milk and so uh the goat's milk generally speaking is a bit easier so i would start there got yeah. it i love talking to you because i'm actually realizing all the things that we did because of you and here you are oh like really first, <laughs> oh yeah like we like we did the probiotic and the cod liver oil in the in the formula we also his first, like, Chaplin's first foods were, like, um, liver, like pate. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> uh, so, we're, I mean, you know, if you want to, do you want to congratulate me? Or, like, do you feel like we're closer now at all? Do, do you congratulate me or this the other Well, I just, I, I don't know. Do you, feel, do you feel closer to us now? Like, I mean, we're your fans. Like, no, we, we, we've done, we've thank lived it. Thank you. <laughs> um, I it's, wanted to talk about... Yeah, well, I want to talk about your book yeah. because um, I put it up on Instagram yesterday and it's a dirty mess now because we've used it so much and we've spilled stuff all over it. I um, but I, what, what age do you think is the right age for babies to start consuming anything but milk? Um, I always try and tell people not to focus too much on an age but more to look for when the signs of readiness are there because mm. like everything babies do they'll do at different ages the general guidelines that were changed in i think it was 2018 um from like the world health and like uh, the australian government the american england all of the sort of big countries at least all have said that solids should be started around the six month mark but not before four months. So uh, what that means is that under four months is dangerous and you should definitely not introduce anything other than breast milk or formula until then. Then you've kind of got a bit of a grey window between four months to, you know, six, seven-ish months around that mark. And the reason that they've said around six months is that most babies, the majority of babies are ready around that six-month mark. So 
you want to look for things like that they can sit up fairly unassisted. Um, what this means is that if you were to put them in a high chair, that you wouldn't have to put all pillows and props and things like that around them. Um, and they'd be able to sort of sit there. Their arms can be resting on the high chair for a bit of support, but basically their trunk and neck and head would be quite steady. That's a really good sign um, that they are going to be able to, uh, you know, firstly reach for food. They need that sort of core strength to be able to reach and move around and tell you that they want more food. A mm -hmm. sign that their core muscles are um, ready to digest the food. So our bodies need to do a thing called peristalsis, which is when it moves the food through the body um, and through the mm -hmm. intestines and through a muscle-like motion. And so uh, those core muscles need to be working well to actually move the food out so they don't get constipated. And that's something that I see quite a lot uh, with baby started too early is that they get chronically constipated because those muscles just aren't working very well. They're a bit sluggish still. Mm. Um, the other thing would be, so sitting is really important, but that head and neck control is probably the most important thing because we really don't want a baby who's sitting in a high chair flopping their head forwards. That's a really big choking risk um, because their airways obviously then partially occluded if they're, chin is dropping down and blocking off the airway. And so they really need to have a really nice, strong head and neck control. Um, the other things that, are, you know, that they're showing interest in foods, this one stumps a lot of people because a lot of babies are very interested in things around that four-month mark, um, but they're not meeting the other signs. And so mm -hmm. I try and remind everyone that at four months they're interested in everything everything around the world they're interested in at that age it's that real sort of age of destruction age of noticing everything and they don't know what food is they're interested in they're watching you and trying to grab for things but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily hungry they would grab for dog poo if you had that in your hand so literally they just, really would and eat it they yes they would and so it's you know they are also putting everything in their mouth they're exploring and that's great like they're all, it's all great things that they're doing and very developmentally normal and you can nurture this time but it doesn't mean you have to start solid so you know you can give them like uh, silicon spoons to play with in their mouth or you can mm -hmm. give them you can still sit them at the high chair with the or, or on your lap while you eat dinner so they can watch and start to learn what they actually need to do with food when it comes time for starting solids because a lot of people start solids plonk them in the high chair put food there and say there you go but they've never actually watched you know or sat at the meal and, and watched and know what to do Mm. And so just getting them to start to be involved, getting them used to sitting at the table, getting them used to, you know, whether it be on your lap, that's fine. Um, you could give them what's called like a hard munchable, which is like a something that you is really big that you're not actually intending them to eat that they can just munch on. So it can be like a whole raw carrot, for example, or a, a big celery stick or um, a bone is a really good one, like a a lamb shank bone or something like that something yeah. that they can just munch on and gnaw on but they're not actually going to eat any of it they're really good to right. sort of get things going um and the other thing you want to look for in terms of signs of readiness is that they can tell you that they've had enough or want more and obviously they can't speak but they can tell you in their own way one way to know this is when you're breastfeeding or bottle feeding them if they are um, able to be able to turn their head away and say I've had enough or, and come back and sort of show you in their own way that they want more they've learned that skill that they could then do that with food um, mm. and so that's really important so that especially if you're going to spoon feed them that they can say I've had enough and put their head away whereas you see some very young babies at that four-ish month mark are just sort of lying there doing absolutely nothing they're not engaging with the meal at all they're not bringing their head forwards towards the meal to indicate that they want more mm -hmm. um, they're just lying, you know, sort of lying back and they're just sort of being spoon fed without doing anything. And that's what you want to try and avoid. You want them to be able to be in control of the meal. And whilst you can help with the spoon, for example, you want them to be in control of how much they're eating and to tell you in their own little way. So they're the big signs of readiness. Yeah, got it. And then what do you think that, that you know, what are the ideal, uh, you know, things that they're going to actually digest, not just gnaw on? What do you think are the ideal first like foods? Like first foods to start with? Yeah. Um, I'll I'll cover I'll try and cover some for 
plant-based and non-plant-based. I'm very wary that a lot of people are plant-based these days, so I try. You want to anger them? You know, I've had them. They the, they comment more than anybody else. But yeah, honestly, I put, a, I put a video up the yeah. other day of like of, of how great vegetables are, and I just thought, oh, this one is easy. No one will get angry at this. And of course, there's some militant carnivore on there who starts arguing with all the <laughs> vegans, and and there's this, and before uh, I know it, there's all these arguments going on. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. I actually, I want to talk to you about that. We'll talk yeah. about it later. You know, offending people with your advice and stuff yeah. like that. Oh yeah, yeah, that one's <laughs> happened many times. Um, For sure. Yeah. So. <laughs> I guess the, the foods that I would recommend would be um, the, the biggest nutrient requirement uh, as a young baby is iron. So a baby from six months to 24 months actually needs more iron than an adult male, which is pretty crazy. Mm. Yeah. So they are going to get some of that through breast milk and formula. So you don't need to freak out, you know, that they need so much, you know, a whole T-bone to get through the day. Mm -hmm. um, but you do need to, that is the biggest thing that we need to start to give them. And around that six month mark is when the iron stores from being in utero are, you know, worn off, I guess. And so they've kind of got enough to keep them going until then. Um, and different things can affect the timing of when that does wear off, like delayed cord clamping or the mother's iron stores in pregnancy, or if, you know, there was any, uh, placental bleeding, et cetera. But generally speaking, around that six months is when you want to give some iron-rich foods. They, and some people still recommend rice cereal with fortified iron in it. <laughs> I'm not a fan of that because you can get iron from natural sources of food. You don't need to fortify with a synthetic version of iron that's often very constipating. And also it's a non-heme source of iron like we talked about earlier. So it's actually not that well absorbed by the body as meat would be and so it wouldn't be my first recommendation however if someone was plant-based it might be a better recommendation than none because otherwise they're not getting really any iron not much at all because they don't ingest much food and so if you're focusing on vegetables and things like that they're not going to get a lot of iron through them so I think still rice cereal can have a place for some diets, but if you do eat meat, I don't think it's necessary at all. Um, and I would rather focus on natural sources of iron, like we talked about earlier for the mum as well. So liver is an yeah. amazing one. Um, and like I said, if you don't want to handle the liver, you, if you can get the desiccated liver, you can just sprinkle that into their food or onto their puree and you've easily made a nutritious iron dense um meal for them in one second so yeah that liver is a beautiful one um you would also want to basically any foods you can start with that are not considered top allergens because you don't want to start their sellers journey on top allergens because then basically you want to see if they tolerate any food not just the allergens you know so just see how they go for a couple of weeks mm -hmm. with just basic foods and work from yeah. there and then introduce the allergens so um, you call them top, any, top any allergens? Big, yeah, so there's the top allergens. There's nine top allergens, which you'll test my memory this morning with this egg. <laughs> um, <laughs> brain's not making very well. Egg, uh, fish, cow's milk, wheat, peanuts, tree nuts, sesame, shellfish, and soy. There you go. Nine wow, top well allergens. Done. Well done. <laughs> um, good for a sleep deprived brain. So, yeah, you wouldn't want to start with any of them for the very first food. So you wouldn't give peanut butter for the very first food, for example, because you want to see, yeah, if they just tolerate any food first and then you could do the peanut butter in a week or two once they're sort of going okay with food. Um, so any beautiful root vegetables are really great. I would start incorporating fats early. So, you know, cooking in some coconut oil, or avocado oil is really nice to start with. And then, like mm -hmm. I said, you could – ghee is a potential allergen so you could bring ghee in a bit later um i would do uh i try and hold off personally on fruit for as long as i can that's a, a personal thing i try and stick to savory as long as i can because anyone with a toddler mm -hmm. knows that it's harder to go back the other way and so there's yes. nothing wrong with fruit absolutely not it's so fine but if you do introduce it early some babies do get a preference for that sweetness because they will gravitate to sweet foods. We all do. It's a 
primal thing to do that and breast milk sweet so they're used to that sweetness so if you can get mm-hmm. them used to savory foods and big flavors from the beginning that's amazing um but yeah things like avocado coconut products are beautiful to introduce first as well um other things spirulina is really good if you are especially if you're plant-based that's a really good one that you can add into foods to make your mm-hmm. puree with some spirulina in it um or you don't have to do puree as well you can sprinkle it onto finger foods yeah so any whole foods i would start with are going to be beautiful any meats and then you can work onto things like your egg yolks um and nut butters those allergens in a couple of weeks after my book does go through all this in much more detail it, than it, it, it's it does easier to it does. explain in a podcast <laughs> it it, yeah. it really does it really does go into it and and something i really liked from the book actually is a bit about don't don't push the idea of just one more bite to your little to your little uh, you know your babies or toddlers it's like if they're they're saying no then the answer is no and just leave them leave them alone i really like that yeah yeah gone um, the days of key comes the airplane <laughs> yeah right How yeah yeah um yeah that's important i wanted to uh uh get some questions from my audience and they gave me a whole bunch um so here we go how can I get my baby to go for healthy food more than unhealthy food? Did they specify the baby's age? <laughs> and so these are great questions that they didn't specify. <laughs> I mean, I know the feeling of this though, baby. because I, because like I, like I said, like we started doing, we were doing the you thing. Like you said, it was all savory. There was no fruits. And then once he got a taste for apples, it's been a never ending story. He just loves apples, loves sweet things. He's unstoppable. Yeah. I've even posted a video of him like where he's trying to get the apple off me and he's like whinging, whinging, whinging. He gets the apple and then he maniacally laughs like, <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen anything <laughs> like it. But it's like, why does, you know, why does sugar do that to us? <laughs> Salt doesn't do that to us. Yeah, I don't know. Well, <laughs> we do know, but yeah. I guess if it's a baby, I would say just don't offer the unhealthy foods. <laughs> right. um, this is, and if it's a toddler, yeah, it's a different story. But mm-hmm. this is the biggest thing that that will help a lot of parents in their parenting and feeding journeys is learning the division of responsibility. And the division of responsibility is from um, Ellen Satter. You can look it up. Um, basically, it is that the caregiver your responsibility is to provide the foods so your responsibility is what foods you provide when you provide them and how you provide them and it is your child's responsibility whether or not they eat it or not Mm -hmm. and that applies for every age and once you learn that it takes so much pressure off of feeding and you know getting them to eat certain things because it's it's ultimately up to them you cannot make someone eat something it's impossible you can't you know maybe when they're a lot older and you can do a lot of bribery but you can't (laughs) make a baby eat something you just they'll just spit it out they'll throw it at you it won't happen and toddlers are even worse so Mm -hmm. the biggest thing is just learning that um and if the foods that you're offering are healthy then that's what they've got on offer obviously there's some different circumstances with you know children with uh learn different learning needs and special things that you know we'll need to do a lot more work with this and so i don't want to disregard those um children but Mm -hmm. it's good to work with us you know an occupational therapist or a speech pathologist if you're having really um, severe issues but Mm -hmm. for the general speaking the biggest thing is is providing that healthy food and generally what i see is people say oh they rejected you know i made dinner they rejected dinner and they wanted toast and it's up to you whether or not you are going to actually make that toast or not or say no and this is what's on the menu tonight this is what we're having for dinner Mm -hmm. um if you don't want it that's fine you don't have to eat it it doesn't bother me but i'm not making something else this is on the menu tonight and that's what i say most nights of my life to be honest <laughs> i and can tell the way you said that was like this woman has said like, this many <laughs> times <laughs> it's a good script and it works, and, it works <laughs> and the biggest 
you know, I, I would say never offer a food that you know they hate if there's no other food on the plate that you know that they like, you know. So you can offer new foods that you're like, oh, I don't know if they like this, which I do all the time. But mm-hmm. there's always something on the plate that I know that they're going to like. And so, you know, if they're rejecting even the food that you know they like, then it's obviously more a behavioural thing rather than, mm-hmm. you know, actually hating the food. And so just remembering that from the from an early age is really important, I think. Yeah, this may be on the on the same along the same line as that, but how to prevent how to prevent a baby from being a picky eater? Yeah, there's different things. Look, toddlers will go through fussy eating. All of them will. It's okay. They'll come out of it generally, but it's more about again you staying firm in your boundaries around eating, and they are going to test those boundaries. They all do. And, you know, I remember thinking I was like amazing because my nearly seven year old didn't, but now he's doing it. Now he's at school, he's starting to do it. And I'm like, I thought I got away with you, you know, not doing this because my middle child is terrible. She's the right. worst of them all. <laughs> but now he's doing, cause he's seeing school kids, you know, who were teasing him about things in his lunchbox and things like that. And so they're all going to go through it at some stage. And mm-hmm. so it's just about us being firm in the boundaries. And so, my biggest tips would be, like we said, introducing big flavors at the beginning um, and not being, not, I have a saying, don't yuck my yum. So don't yuck something that might be yum to them. If, you yeah. know, we might think sardines, yuck, or liver, yuck. But yeah. they're often the things babies like the most. They often love those big flavors. And so don't shy away just because you don't like them because they might. Um, mm. The other thing would be, uh, to eat as a family as much as you can um the biggest tip with all of these fussy eating questions and how i get my kids to eat this this this, is to sit with them and eat the same meals as much as you can they might have a bit of a derivative of your meal but trying to not make a separate child's meal you know every now and then you might need to if there's something particular they can't have but if you can try and eat the same foods um that is probably going to be the biggest help for you longevity wise is to sit with them for as many meals as you can. And, you know, it might not happen every night and that's okay. But if you can try and do it on weekends, if you can try and do breakfast, if you can pick some times of the day that you can actually sit and eat with them and talk to them about it, you know, as they get older, get them in the kitchen, helping cooking or even going when they, when you shop, picking the ingredients, you know, things like that to, you know, saying what meal would you like this week and and making them a part of it is really important. Um, And platter style meals I find really helpful as the kids get older too so that they can help themselves and feel in control of the meal because that's what toddlers want is control, to feel in control. And so really we know we're in control because we have put the food out there that they are allowed to choose from. But they think they're in control because they're choosing those foods. So say you make have a Mexican night, for example, and you've got all of the, you know, avocado and cheese and lettuce and tomato and things that they are in control of what they actually put on their plate. They work really well um, for fussy toddlers as well. So they would be my biggest tips there. Um, and just keeping food in the conversation as well as much as you can, talking to them about it, letting them as a baby being exposed to different textures, feeling the food, don't shy them away from exploring food. If you are not going down baby led weaning route, you can still do that with purees. You can still put puree on their tray and allow them to play with it and have that whole sensory experience Um, because food is a lot more than just nutrients. There's there's a lot to it. Yeah, I did like that part of the book where you mentioned that, you know, even if you're feeding them a puree, just put a little bit on the tray. So they can play with it with their hands, yeah. get the feel for it. Totally, yeah. Um, choking freaks me out. And I tell you what, like <laughs> in the first, what is it, been like 19 months of a child's life, the amount that you just like, you you like you can hear them choking or you hear them like coughing like really heavily, mm. it, it freaks, it, it's the one thing that freaks me out still and it, and it happens often. Um, any tips? I think my big thing to tell people is that there's a big difference between choking and gagging. Um, 
choking is actually not overly that common and it mm. is scary and something that you should be scared of. Gagging, however, generally sounds a lot scarier because it's it's the thing that you're is describing, that coughing and that horrible sound that they make. But gagging is very developmentally normal and something that will get better with age, but something that they generally will all go through as well. And leaving finger foods till later um, doesn't always help with this. It actually can sometimes make things worse because they haven't had any of that sort of gagging experience while their body has safeguards in place to help them against choking when they're younger. So Mm. when they're younger, their body has safeguards in um, place like the epiglottis at the back of the throat sort of closes over to help food go down the right pathways. Um, and so with the when they get older, sometimes that isn't happening as much anymore and so the gagging can end up leading to choking. So that's why baby lead weaning is great to do from, I would say I wouldn't leave it any later than eight months. It doesn't mean you have to do full baby lead weaning, but I would introduce some finger foods by that eight-month mark. Mm-hmm. Um, some that you might feel discomfortable with just to to get your baby to learn how to gag properly how to move food for through the mouth how to spit food out how to prevent themselves from choking because essentially it's them that needs to learn how to not choke um we can't really teach that they need to learn that for themselves and so um gagging is different in that gagging is very dramatic sounding so gagging will have a sound to it so they'll be coughing they'll be retching there might be vomiting there'll be that that i'm not going to do that noise but you know that <laughs> you, you're an actor you can do that noise <laughs> the retching sound yeah that right yeah, there you go. <laughs> there'll be all of that <laughs> um they they'll go really red in the face um mm. and it's dramatic so that's the best way to explain it gagging is dramatic Whereas choking is silent. Choking is when the airway is occluded. There's something that's blocking the airway. And so there's no air or very minimal air moving up and down through the airway. And so they aren't able to make those noises. Mm. They aren't Mm. able to cough. They aren't able to vomit. They aren't able to move the food through. And so that's very different to gagging. So if you notice your baby's gagging, if they're coughing a lot and retching and going really red in the face, the best thing you can do, and it's hard, is try and remain very calm. Try and talk them through it. You could put your hand out in front of their mouth and sort of stick your tongue out and, and try and coach them to sort of move the food and to spit it into your hand is a good tip. Um, and basically after that, and you probably have experienced it, after the gagging, they're fine. They just go for the next bite like nothing had happened. Have you, do you feel like that? They go through this I whole did. thing and you have a heart attack and then they're like, oh, I'm right now, and they just keep eating. You're like, oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I highly recommend doing a CPR course because I was worried about it to the point of being totally. like, I, how, what am I supposed to do? And then I'm taking a CPR course, still scared, but uh, a little bit more prepared. For sure. And, yeah, that would be definitely my next tip is to do a baby first aid because then if they – they'll teach you as well in much more um, emphasis what the difference between the two are and how to identify them. And then if your baby does choke on something, then you'll know what to do. But to Mm -hmm. be honest, most babies choke on things that are are not in your control. You know, they found a a rock on the ground or, a, you know – something random on the ground is usually what they choke on rather than food in a controlled environment. And so it's good to know baby first aid anyway, regardless, um, Mm -hmm. because you never know. We don't want to be in that circumstance ever. Um, But yeah, learning the difference between the two. And if your baby's gagging, trying not to intervene would be my biggest tip. Um, Because if you do stick your fingers down their throat when they are gagging to try and get it out, you actually do pose more of a risk of causing choking because then you might push the food back further in the airway. And so baby's gag reflexes are actually quite far forward, again, as a protective mechanism against choking. So they'll actually gag way earlier than the foods in the airway, if that makes sense. So, Mm -hmm. you know, like with us, we have to stick something pretty far down the back of our throat to gag on it, whereas babies, you Mm -hmm. don't have to. They gag pretty early. Um, before that and that's to to prevent against choking and so they just need to learn and work out how much food and how far back they can put food in their mouth 
and giving them things if you're really worried, like, you know, we're talking about a silicon spoon or those hard munchables, they can be really good to learn with gagging because you're not worried that they're going to actually choke on the food. The food's so long and large that, you know, say, for example, a whole watermelon rind or something, you're mm. not worried that they're going to choke on that, but they might gag a lot, but that's okay because you might feel a lot more less stressed about the whole situation um, because yeah. you can see that they haven't actually choked on anything. Yeah. That could be a good tip. Cool. Oh, sorry, I've got a million jokes running around my head and I'm, like, I'm not going to say any of them. <laughs> so let's move on. <laughs> and I was let's doing some on. hand motions and I was like, that looks really bad. I'm gonna uh, no, 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 no. It's not. <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the controversy now yeah. like because it is i mean i've only i've only had a, a health podcast for the last few weeks and already like i told mm-hmm. you people just want to argue it doesn't matter what piece of advice you post people are ha- angry and hating it how do you put yeah. up with that and especially mums because mums are very like you know a bit more precious and they they can feel judged very easily Mm. i just want to know how you deal with it um (laughs) good question i it used to affect me it does still affect me of course i'm just a person a Mm mum behind this phone um it still affects me for sure but it used to affect me a lot more when i first started absolutely i think there's a funny meme that's out that's like says oh you know, I like oranges and then it's like, but what about pineapple and mango and this and this? And that's what I feel like all the time. If I say one little thing, it's like, "Ah, what about all this? And I'm like, I'm not saying that's bad. Just saying I like this thing. Um, One, I have found though, like that as my account has grown, that I'm attracting probably more people that uh, agree with things that I speak about. So I have actually found it's gotten better over time, whereas when I was, you know, more starting out, there was a lot more controversy. But now I get more attacks from uh, other professionals in the health space, which is harder, I feel like, and some are quite horrible and mean. Mm -hmm. And um, that's hard, but I have to always remind myself that there's research for everything and you can find research for whatever you want to claim but it might not be good research and Mm -hmm. it's learning how to read the research and my biggest thing is when I say something and put it out there that I want it to be research backed and then when people argue with me I you can't argue with you know peer-reviewed research I just throw that back at them and I say this is where I got it from and that's my biggest thing and you know whether you want to throw your peer-reviewed research back at me is fine and that's fine we there's different opinions on everything and there's no one can agree what the best diet is for you know it's there's so many different ones out there and um i think it's just learning who to listen to in the space has been my biggest thing learning who whose voice you want to listen to who resonates with you as you know mine's more parenting obviously who resonates in that space you know, for example, I don't really want to follow someone that promotes rigid uh, sleep training because that's not something that I personally would want to do. But that's fine. If you want to do it, I'm just going to stay away from, you know, I don't need to to be consumed by that. I'd rather follow people that make me feel okay than I'm awake eight times a night still at one year old, you know. <laughs> and so it's like I think it's just learning who – who you want to listen to, who you want to, yeah, have speaking into your life and to remember that you have control over that as well. And there's a good option called blocking people that you can block. Blocking is great. Block the it? trolls. Yeah. yeah I don't mind Do you it. find it hard? I don't mind the rest- no, no. I, I, to be honest, um, people are very, people are very nice, nice to me. Like I haven't caught much hate online at all. A couple of like attempted cancellations, because you know when you do comedy, like it's like it's either a it's it's either funny or it's not. And if it's not funny, no one's going to tell you it's not funny. People just move on. Whereas if they find something <laughs> that you've done like offensive or they disagree with it, then they're going to say something. Uh, so a couple of jokes yeah. maybe uh, people have taken offensively. Every time it's ridiculous because I really do think through what I'm doing when I yeah. do it, and, and I and I go mm, anything offensive there, maybe a little bit, but not really. 
uh, and then, you know, people will jump down. And it won't be for the thing that you thought was a little bit offensive. It'll be for something completely different. I'm not going to give you an example because if I bring it up, people might hear it and then they'll really they'll, 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 they'll cancel me again. But I wanted to talk to you about, because yeah. Clara mentioned this to me, uh, that your friend uh, breastfed uh, your son. Well, you had a weekend away or something yeah. like that. And and that was some controversy, oh, I tried. right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it did actually, which I wasn't expecting. Like you said, it's always the things that yeah, you don't expect. I would say it was mostly positive comments. There was just a few horrible ones. But, yeah, um, my friend group, we have a lot of babies the same age, but to us it's very normal. Like a lot of them breastfeed each other's babies, you know, if you're looking after them or even if you're not, sometimes they're just hungry. And they'll some, literally we've got friends who's, uh, they're twins and their babies will go up to each other and just ask for milk and they'll just breastfeed. It's quite funny. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I was going – I was planning to go to a wedding. I did go to the wedding, but um, I did. she didn't end up having to come to feed. But my backup was that, that she would come and feed my baby if he wouldn't take a bottle um, and she would come here and do that. And so, you know, we gave it a practice run and he took to it fine and that was great. Um, mm -hmm. but since then she has actually fed him a few more times, which has been handy <laughs> and, yeah, well. you know, it's good if you're, yeah, like, I don't know, breastfeeding is amazing and, you know, so good, but it can be very isolating for some people. Like I know personally, none of my children have taken a bottle. This baby I found the easiest because we were in lockdown for most of his life. And so I didn't feel like that, you know, I'm missing out on anything kind of feeling but the other two I definitely did especially my first when no one else had kids I felt very like isolated that I couldn't go anywhere and he wouldn't take a bottle and so to have mm -hmm. people that you can rely on to feed your baby if you can't be there or if you had to go to hospital or if, you know you were sick or anything is such a nice thing but yeah there was a few negative comments yeah, I mean, how <laughs> on there you? How dare you do this ancient thing yeah. that's been done for, for, for eons of time how yeah. dare you I've come to realize too that people that comment negative things, it's a reflection on their own life and it's a reflection on their own insecurities, their own, mm. you know, doubts and regrets and things like that. And so I try and just remember that with a graceful heart when they're saying horrible things that there's a reason that they're saying it because I would never think personally to comment on something negative you know i would just keep moving on and let that feeling go by me but yeah right I but if you comment and, if you comment and, and, and let back them on know them. <laughs> right but you see if you comment and let them know that hey this is a reflection of you then it's a reflection of <laughs> them on you that you're reflecting back to them and are you now reflecting <laughs> and then anyway. you say, well, <laughs> exactly exactly and then block them where can we how can we find you support you and follow you um, my Instagrams where I'm the most active, which is at Boob to Food. Uh, we have a website, boobtofood.com, and my book is called Milk to Meals, which is also available on my website. So, yeah, that's me. Excellent. I'm going to link to your website and your Instagram in the show notes for this. So anybody who is interested, please do go ahead and follow Luke and McCabe. And, and are you proud of me? I didn't call you boob once, and I, I, I thought that I might. <laughs> So many people do. I'm so used to it. <laughs> right. Well, but it's your handle. Oh, so, like, I call people by the handle all the time. I know, and I should have really re rethought that when I first started. <laughs> I did not. In I did not anticipate that it would be as big as it was, and I think I would have definitely rethought being called Boop to Food. Do you know why well, the biggest thing you. is that yeah. all of my emails go to spam? Because they think I'm like a porno person. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can't advertise. So if I help how I have to I can't advertise on Instagram, it bans me every time. I can't get that blue tick thing, you know, because wow. I have boo in my name. There's so many things and I think I didn't think of any of this stuff. So if anyone's starting a business, don't write the word boob in your business. Your yeah, boob. I mean I was I was like, Forever there's a reason that you called time. your book milk to meals and not boob to food. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Easier to advertise milk to meals. <laughs> you would have ended up in the adult section of any bookstore. I know. It's so, yeah, I did still didn't think of it at all. But anyway, you live and you learn, don't you? <laughs> you do. I mean, it could have been like tits to, it could have been tits to, I don't know. Tits something. to table? 
Pits to Pits table. table. Oh, yes, thank you. It could have been that. It could be. Mu- it could have been much worse. I love food to food. I, I think it's. Worse. I think it's great. We're very thankful for. I'm very thankful for your time today, Luca. But also very thankful for oh, all you. the wisdom that you put out into the world, and then that I and my wife got get to use in order to raise <laughs> a healthy boy. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you, and um, congratulations on number two as well. Yeah, he's he's on route. Yeah, very exciting. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Luca.